Hey, Mike with Nerd Problems Gaming here, the channel where we go through the good and bad of everything nerdy to make sure you spend your time on the best of the best. In today's video, I'll be doing a review and how to play of Rick and Morty Munchkin, so let's get into it. This is the first version of a Munchkin game that I've actually played before. I've seen a lot of them around and it always intrigued me to check it out, but this version stood out as well because I'm a big Rick and Morty fan, so I thought it'd be fun to check out and pick up. And so the game itself is kind of like a simplified RPG where you start with a base character and you're going to collect various cards and defeat monsters to be the first player to reach level 10. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can level up and items that you can equip and use to power up your character. Plus it can be both cooperative and competitive at the same time as you play with other players. The game itself is three to six players and it takes around maybe an hour or longer to play, depending on how the cards come up and what other players do. But let's dive into how to play the game so you can learn a little bit more about that, and then I'll jump into my full review after that. All right, so the first thing is the setup of the game, and the start of the game, you want to decide who is going to go first. So you can just do that by rolling the die if you choose, and again, picking who rolls the highest die first uh, can be the first person to go. The next thing that you want to do is shuffle up the roll cards and these are basically the characters that you'll be playing as. So for example, you've got the various characters that you can play as. So Summer, Mr. Poopy Butthole, Rick, Beth, Jerry, and Morty. So you'll shuffle these up and randomly deal them out uh, to the various players. So let's say for example, you're playing a three player game. So you got Rick, Morty, and Jerry. Now that this is done, what you wanna do is take the treasure cards and deal out four to each player. And then you'll also take the door cards and deal out four to each player. And this is going to form the starting hands for the game. Every player will start on level one and now the goal of the game is to be the first player to reach level 10 and so there's various ways to do that as you play every time you kill a monster for example you would level up a level there are also some cards that you can use to level up a level and then you can also turn in items to level up a level so i'll show you a little bit more on that and how those different cards work so there's various card types throughout the game and each one will have different abilities accordingly. So each player can equip a class. So the class will give them special abilities and either bonuses or maybe negative things as well based on the class. And typically each player can equip one type of class, but there's also a card called the Super Munchkin which allows you to equip two of the classes. And so you'll get all of the benefits but none of the negatives uh, from your second class when you equip that. So that's pretty cool if you happen to get that card. There's also cards that you'll be able to use during combat to make monsters stronger or weaker because as you play, you can either help people out in combat or sabotage them as well, depending on the scenario. Or again, even play cards to make yourself stronger. So keep that in mind. There's also trap cards, which create negative effects on the player. And so you'll just simply need to read this card as it comes up and then play by the rules it tells you accordingly. This is a card called Wandering Monster. So when we get to combat, we'll talk about this more, but this allows you to add a monster to combat. So you can make basically the monster stronger or harder to defeat uh, for an opposing player. This is a monster card, but it's also a parasite. And so what this means is that if you happen to draw a parasite card, you need to roll the die, and if it's between one and three, you'll have to draw from the discard pile to look for the next parasite, and you add that to the power level of this character. And then once again, you'll roll the dice doing the same process. If it's one to three, you'll have to add another parasite from the discard pile. If it's four or higher, you stop, and that monster is gonna stay at the level it's at. But we'll get to that more when we talk about combat. You also have just regular monsters and this is their power level. They usually have specific abilities that they 
can activate when they're on the field. They have bad stuff that happens if you can't escape from them and then treasure amounts that you get when you defeat them. Characters can also equip various items like armor. And so each character has the ability to hold two things in their hands. They can also hold uh, chest type of armor, foot type armor, and head type armor. And so you can only equip one of each of the head, foot, and chest, and then two hand items, so one for each hand. These will give you bonuses accordingly to your combat ability. They also usually have written text that add bonuses or have extra things that happen when you equip these items. Each player can also equip one ally, giving them additional bonuses and abilities. But if a card happens to allow you to equip more than one ally, you can do that. Or there's a neat card called Cheat. So the Cheat card is pretty cool where it allows you to basically bend the rules uh, for various cards. So for example, normally you can only equip one ally, but if you paired it with a Cheat card, you could equip a second one. Same thing with items. You maybe could only equip one helmet normally, but if you use a cheat card, you could equip multiple helmets. Or again, maybe you could only use a card at a certain time, but if you pair it with a cheat card, you could then use that card. So play at your discretion using this rule, but it's pretty cool uh, to be able to do that and change how the game works for the players. There's also one-shot cards. These basically allow you to use an item one time or use an ability one time, and you just simply read what the card says. There's also cards that allow you to go up a level. Normally you need to defeat a, an enemy to go up a level, but this allows you to just do it immediately. You cannot use a level up card though to win the game. So to reach level 10, you have to defeat a monster. You can also level up by taking these points at the bottom and adding up to increments of a thousand. So for example, we've got six, two, and four. So that's a thousand right here. So you could turn in these cards of a thousand point value, discard them, and then level up a level. Now any extra points above and beyond that thousand you lose, so you round down to the nearest thousand, but you could add even more to push yourself over 2000, for example. So this is a neat strategy you can use if you have extra cards in your that you don't want to use or give to another player, you could add up to a thousand points, and give yourself a level up. Again, you can't use this to reach level 10 to win the game, but you can do it throughout the game. Also, with any equipment cards that you have, this bonus number would go towards your attack total. So we'll get to combat in a bit. So when it comes to playing a turn, basically how it works is that you can play any cards in your hand as far as going up levels, as far as playing allies, you can do that, equipping items, equipping classes, playing traps on other players. So you have a lot of freedom to play different cards at this time. You won't play monsters, however, at this time. So keep those in your hand for now. But again, so let's say we're taking Rick's turn at this point. I could play equipping that, adding an ally, and going up a level at this time. The next phase of your turn consists of kicking open the door, which is just simply drawing one of the door cards. So now what happens is you are either going to fight a monster if you happen to draw one, or you'll simply take the card if it doesn't happen to be a monster. So in this case, I'm now fighting a level two monster with Rick because that's what I drew. You also notice that it's a parasite card. So like I talked about before at this time, I would have to roll the die and see if I got a three or lower and draw from the discard pile another parasite if I happen to do that. Uh, in this case, I rolled a four and there is no discard pile, so I don't really need to worry about that. So at this point, my goal is to have a power level that is higher than level two. And so with Rick, he's on level two right now and I've got a couple bonuses. So I've got a plus one and a plus two so that's three plus two is five. So my five is higher than level two. So at this point, I would have beaten this card. But what's neat is that you can look at the extra writing here on the card and it says it gets plus three if you have a trip planned within the next two weeks. So it kind of breaks the fourth wall here. And so if you have a trip planned, he gets stronger. So that's kind of funny. But in this case, I don't. So he stays at level two and now I have beaten him. Now what's cool is the other players at this point 
could play cards to sabotage my victory. So they might have a card that makes the monster stronger. They might have a trap that they can play on me to make it so I can't beat this monster. Or they can simply let me win and level up and get the treasure associated with this card. In this case, it would be one treasure. So let's just say they let me win, all good. I go up a level and then I'll draw the treasure card into my hand. Now I could use that card immediately if I chose to, if I was able to, but at this point I'm not. And now what happens is I need to discard down to five cards and you discard via charity by giving your cards that are above and beyond five to the weakest players on the board. So in this case, Jerry and Morty are tied at level one, so I could give one card to my choosing of either player and they would get that card. Now the play will shift to the next player and it's now their turn to go through this same process. So let's say Jerry is next. We'll check out his hand, see what we've got available. So I'm going to equip an ally. None of these other cards look like they're usable right now, except for the super genius class. So I'm gonna equip that. And these are all one shot items, so I can use these to either uh, enhance my character during combat or to sabotage other players during combat as well. I've got a trap card so I could play this on a player uh, if I wanted to. And then this monster card I can use during an, uh, the next phase of the turn. And so again, you're gonna kick open the door, another level one monster. Let's say for example though, when I drew the kick open the door card, it was not a monster and it just happened to be a regular card. What I would do at this point is add this card to my hand and I have a couple different options at this point. I can play a monster from my hand that I want to fight uh, because I think I can beat them or I can choose to loot the room. And if I loot the room, I'll simply draw the next card, adding that to my hand and I could use that on a future turn. So again, let's say for example, I wanted to sabotage a player in the future I could use my wandering monster card in this level 16 monster to really up the level of the current monster they're fighting, making it extremely difficult for them to win. Or for example, it's my turn next round and I want to play a monster. This is only a level one, so it might be easier for me to beat. And so I'll play that since I didn't draw a monster card. And again, at the end of the turn, you'll have to discard down to five cards again going to the lowest player uh, first. If there's ever a tiebreaker or you wanna divide it however you want, you get to choose as the discarder, but it needs to go to the lowest level characters when you do this. If there's ever a case where you can't beat a monster, you can ask for help. And so you can ask other players to assist you uh, when fighting this monster. So it's cool, for example, this is a level 16 character. So I might not be able to beat this by myself, but if I do win, I'm gonna gain two levels and four pieces of treasure. And so what I could do at this point is ask for other players for help and then bribe them with said treasure. So I might ask Rick, for example, to help me out and say, hey, I'll give you two treasures of these four if you help me beat this monster, or I'll give you all four treasures if you help me beat this monster. I'll give you a treasure and my ally card here uh, to help me defeat this monster. And so if someone helps out, they basically will take their power level and add that to your power level to hopefully be able to defeat that monster. And so you need to be one level higher than the monster. You can't be equal to it because if it's equal, you still lose. But let's say no one wants to help you out and you still lose. At this point, what you do is you attempt to run away. So you'll roll the die and it needs to be five or higher to escape. If you escape, you just simply uh, escape from the monster if you don't escape and you roll lower than five, you need to read what the bad stuff is on the monster card and that's what happens to you. And then if multiple people are trying to defeat a monster and all of them fail, they both need to individually attempt to run away. And the bad stuff will happen to those that fail the runaway roll. At this point, play will just simply continue between the players in a clockwise fashion where each will take their turn consisting of playing cards that they already have in their hand, kicking open the door by drawing one from this pile. If it is a monster, they will have to fight it. If it's not, they'll take that card in their hand. They now have the opportunity to either play a monster from their hand to fight that themselves or loot the room 
and just draw another card that they can use on a future turn. They'll discard down to five and then it will go to the next player. And this play continues until one player finally reaches level 10. Also in this kick on the door phase, if you happen to draw a trap card on the first time kicking open the door, not looting the room, this trap is actually activated on you as a negative effect. But if you draw it during the looting phase, you'll get to keep this in your hand that you can then use on another player. So again, you just wanna make sure that you check the abilities on the cards that you're playing as that can add in extra rules or extra things that are happening. But beyond that, that's the basic rules of Munchkin. Certainly consult the rule book if you have questions or drop a comment below if you have more questions on how the game is played. But now that you have a better understanding on how to play, let's jump into my review. Well guys, now that you know how to play the game and understand a bit more on how the gameplay works, how do I actually feel about the game? Well, I really actually enjoy this game a lot. Like I had said, I've never really played a Munchkin game before. And this was a cool entry point into the series. I think if you're a Rick and Morty fan, you'll definitely enjoy this as well as there's all kinds of inside jokes and characters from the shows. So you're equipping various different armor types and getting allies that you meet throughout the series as well. So that's fun to see. And I think this version has a great quirkiness to it and very similar humor to the show as well, which is great to see. I also recommend this game just because it's pretty simple to learn. So if you are looking for a game that's not too difficult and looking for an RPG type game that you don't need to sink dozens of hours into, this could be a great option. I like that the game has both a cooperative aspect and a competitive aspect. It kind of gave me a feeling of like when I play Settlers of Catan where people are kind of bartering and negotiating where you're like, hey, I'll help you out here if you give me that treasure or you see somebody's in the lead and you want to sabotage them to make it difficult for them to level up and defeat a monster. So it's kind of cool where it's changing all the time depending on what cards are out and what cards are in play. Another thing that I really liked about this game is the fact that it kind of broke the fourth wall, I guess you could say in a sense, where a lot of the cards would give you bonuses or hinder your players, where it might be weird things like if you're wearing pants, and it would be like if you're wearing pants in the real world, uh, you know, nothing to do necessarily with the game, or if there's ice cubes on the table, you know, this player gets an extra bonus three damage or whatever the case might be. So it's kind of cool to see that where uh, different characters would have enhanced abilities or negative effects based on things that were happening in the real world. So that added a really fun twist to the game as well. Another thing that I liked about this game is the cheat cards that were in it. And so there's various cards that allow you to cheat the system basically and play cards that you couldn't normally play. So for example, if you had uh, extra allies, you can normally only lay one of those out at a time, but if you play it alongside a cheat card, you could play another one. Or maybe you can only equip one helmet, but you play it with a cheat card and now you can equip two. And so that created a cool dynamic where it kept the game fresh and again, different every time, but really allowed you to have all these different strategies you could use to level up and build up your character. So I think again, that added to the replay value of the game where you had a lot of opportunities to win in different means. Plus when you start off, typically you play where you randomize the character that you get. So they have different starter abilities. So again, that creates a new dynamic every single time that you play. So again, I really recommend checking this game out if you haven't played a Munchkin game before. If you're a fan of Rick and Morty, I think this is a great game to pick up and play. But let me know in the comments below if you played other Munchkin games, if you find that they're different or they're maybe similar to this one or what other great Munchkin games I should check out and pick up because there's so many in the series, all kinds of different versions of the game, but this Rick and Morty one is a lot of fun. So again, I'd recommend checking out if you haven't. If you'd like to pick up a copy, there'll be a link in the description below where you can do so. But again, if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button as it really helps out the channel. And if you haven't done so, be sure to subscribe and turn on those bell notifications to get the latest updates of new nerd videos we put out here. And if you'd like to help us support the channel, pick out content and more, become a patron of ours at nerdproblemsgaming.com forward slash Patreon. And if you'd like to plug into our live streams and Let's Plays we do on the channel, you can follow us on Twitch over at nerdproblemsgaming.com forward slash Twitch. But once again, thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you more soon.